Hello, I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is Life After Scientology, and welcome to another episode. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge those people who become Patreons this past, I guess, a few weeks. So let me get right into that without any further words, and uh, I hope I don't murder your names. I think I can get them okay. Angela Thompson, $2. Thank you very much, Angela. Very much appreciated. And then T. Luke Lucari is it Italian? Am I saying it right? Lucari? If I'm murdering it, I apologize. T Lucari, two dollars. Anna, thank you very much. And then we have Buffy. Buffy, that's a real mainline name. That's that's one of these names that uh, you don't forget. Buffy, two dollars, and thank you very much, Buffy. And then uh, Anno Nom, Anno Nom. $2, and thank you very much. And then Eric Van, okay, let me just think about it a second. Van Granis, Eric Van Granis, $1, thank you very much. And then we have Anonymous from Texas, $20, and it's very much appreciated. Thank you very much, Anonymous from Texas. I hope the Cowboys have a good year this year because it looks like Everybody's healthy now, and this, this is going to be a nice uh, conference. That's an aside. I don't even know if you're a Cowboys fan, but whatever. An honor <laughs> from Texas, 20 bucks. And then we have <clears throat> Bill Quigley, and that's for $1, and I thank you very much. And just, of, just those of you who wonder what this is about, if you go to my website, therealronmiscavige.com, you can sign up for Patreon where you can contribute a dollar or two dollars or five or ten or a hundred, whatever you want to on a monthly basis. And that's to help us defray expenses for us doing the show. As I've said on many other programs, we're on our own dime. I don't have a sponsor. And quite frankly, I actually don't want a sponsor because I want this to be as free as it absolutely can be. And I don't want anybody telling me a person can't say this or they can't say that. Anybody who comes on this program, if you're invited, and as I said in the past, I won't invite anarchists or somebody like that. But if I invite you on, you can tell your whole story. And I won't throw you under the bus. I'll treat you with respect. And I know many of the speakers I've had on this program have been on national TV as myself. I did 2020 and a couple others where for 2020, I was interviewed for over eight hours. And maybe they had about 18 minutes of me on the air and which didn't even tell the story I wanted to tell. So. Here you go. This is a program where you can voice your opinion, tell your story. And those of you who uh, are patrons are contributing to the success of this. And I appreciate it very much for your help. So now, without any further words, I would like to introduce my guest for today. And this is a very gutsy person. She has an amazing story. And she's been around for a long time telling the story uh, on her videos. But I, would, I, I invited her on to come and tell her story to my guests. And maybe some of you have never heard her. Or maybe you have. Maybe we can get some further information out of her that hasn't been told. And her name is Tori Christman. But you might know her as Tori Magoo 44. And there's a reason that that name was picked, which we can get into after she tells this. Tori, how did you get started in Scientology? Just why don't you just get into that a little bit, okay? I will. I will. Is it Is echoing? It echoing? Nope, it's okay here. Okay. So first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on because I really appreciate it. I've seen some of your other interviews and you're really good at doing it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, how I got in, I read a book. That's why they always say read a book. That's one of their basic things on how to get people in is read a book. And what and was I read, that book? I read a bit of Dianetics, and I had an argument with my dad in 1969. And he said, go to bed. It's 1030 at night. I was in college. 
and I'd read Dianetics and I thought, oh, come on. I, no, I'm not going to go through this for years with my father telling me what to do. So I pulled down my shade and I put your, because he said, it's our morals or no school. And so I pulled down my shade and wrote in lipstick, your morals or no school through you. And I hitchhiked from Chicago to Los Angeles because at the back of the Dianetics book, it said St. Hill, England, which I knew I wasn't getting there or American St. Hill in L.A. Wow. So you <laughs> lived in Chicago at the time. Yeah, I was in Lake Forest College. Wow. Well, I live in Wisconsin, so that's not too far oh. from where I live. Anyway. Yeah, I grew, I grew up in Chicago. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, I'll tell you, that's, that's how a lot of people get started. I, I didn't read a book, but I met a guy who was a Scientologist, and I well, grilled him for about a half an hour, and he told me all about it. So that's how I get started. Anyway, so that's same how. Same thing. You, I mean, see, that this guy brought me the Dianetics book. Oh, okay. That's the thing. They, cult experts always say in Scientology, for anybody listening who isn't familiar with it, Scientology is not really a religion per se, as you think of a religion. It's very much, per the cult definition, a cult. And um, they cult experts say people, no one joins a cult. Cults come and get you. See, that's the thing. That's why I try to keep educating people on Scientology. And they'll say, oh, I know it. But they don't know, as you know, they have their little secret ways of getting people in. That's an interesting take on it. They do come and get you. That, that is they very, do. They, they have central files that go back. Oh, to the 100%. Yeah. 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 Which is a bit insane because a lot of those people are dead. I mean, you know, but they're, <laughs> they're counting on going after people. And I, I know of people who told me they would take a little course and then leave Scientology and they would get mail for the next 10 or 20 years. Talk about a small world. Last night, my brother lives in Spain. His son just graduated from Amsterdam University and his, his mother lives in Spain, in Ibiza, Spain. That's where they live. So mm. they come here to celebrate his graduation. We do all kinds of stuff. And the last day she says, we're going out to Burning Man but we're going to go up to some friends' houses in Malibu. If you want to come, you can come visit. So I I look on the map, and it's way at the north end of, of Malibu. And so I'm driving there, and I'm thinking, you know what? Eric Sherman used to live up in this area. And so I drive up this street, and I go, oh, my God, it's Eric's house. I walk in, and I meet these people. They're all, you know, just wonderful Israeli people and just delicious food they've made all this stuff and the owner comes up and i to introduce himself and i said you know what i think i know the owner of your home and he says what's his name and i said eric sherman and this guy that owns their house now is a famous director and he said wow. i get mail from him every day and i said from the church of scientology right and he goes yep <laughs> wow and i told him about my story just in a couple of seconds and he goes i love hearing stuff like that and I gave him my card because I always carry around a business card with different like Tony Ortega, Zenu.net, and my YouTube site, Tori Magoo 44. Yeah. And as long as we're on that, why don't you tell uh, our listeners how you come up with that name, Tori Magoo 44? I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. My father was a, fo a professional football player. He's in the American Football Hall of Fame. And his number was 44. And he passed away when I was fifty. When he was fifty-one, I was twenty-two, and I loved him. He was a great guy, and I missed him a lot. So now, roll forward. I'm in Scientology. I've been in there for thirty years. I wake up, and I can't talk to anyone. You you just can't. You can't call up your friends and say, "I think I'm leaving." My husband was out of town. I couldn't have talked to him anyway because he was born in Scientology. So anyway, I kind of plugged into my father and just was like, what should I do? And I just got like a frying pan in the face. Get out of Los Angeles now. Right. And yeah. he was right. And I did. I got out of L.A. I went to Clearwater, Florida for about a month. And I thought, I got to keep this guy near me because he's very courageous and he's very strong. And I felt like he was going to protect me. So and I always called him Magoo, Mr. Magoo, because he was funny. He worked for, as well as being a, he worked for the Chicago Cardinals as a quarterback. But then later in the 60s, he worked with Kurt Gowdy as a broadcaster for football. 
wow. and including uh, the Green Bay Packers. He played for them one time, the Green Bay Packers. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so anyway, he was uh, kind of a wild guy. And I thought, I just want to keep him near me. So that's so where Magoo came from, Tori Magoo. And then his football number is 44. And I always loved that. So Tori Magoo, 44. Wow. And now let me ask you this. Did it have anything to do with Mr. Magoo? You know, the character that Jim. Back yes, it did. Him? Because I have, see, my eyes are kind of tiny. See, I'll, I'll take, see how li they're little. Yeah. You know, I have like little kind of squinty eyes. And so did he. And he was funny. And Mr. Magoo was funny. I and know. So, that's why I called him Magoo, because I thought, you know, he was funny on the air. He helped really bring football into the massive industry it is now per other football players. They've told me, yeah, your dad was major in changing that. Well, and what was his name again? It was his full name. Paul Christman. Paul Christman. Yeah. You can I, I Google can it. On the internet. That, that's interesting because yeah. the, the name doesn't ring a bell for me. But what years did he play football? Early on, that's why. He played uh, 49, 50, 51. Oh, okay, because I didn't start watching pro football until the 50s. And a friend of mine, right. Stash Galitsky, introduced me to – we used to listen to it on the radio. There was no TV on it those, in those days. Yep. Uh, that, that's interesting how you got that name. And uh, you've been around a long time putting out videos and everything. But let, let's stick with, with that time period because we were talking prior to this, and you mentioned a guy by the name of Bill Yowdy. If we could get into how he was involved with you or what you were doing with him or uh, about okay. the relationship, that, that'd be interesting, I think. Okay. Um, uh, let me just put a little bit in between there because I wasn't really involved with him till in the 90s. And I, I got in Scientology in 1969. And I want to make one thing clear to any of your listeners, because some of this that I'm going to say just sounds insane. Because you're very used to the internet. Many people were born with the internet. And we were not. You know, Ron. You know, right. we were years in Scientology with no access to any information against Scientology. And if you went and looked or read or talked to anybody that was negative of Scientology, you could easily get declared an SP or suppressive yeah. person. Oh, yeah. So most people just didn't, you know, we didn't look. We, there were a couple of books out, didn't read them. You know, that was it. But yeah. roll forward. I got married. I had a son. You know, we had a wonderful relationship. But Yachty came to me in the mid 90s. His name is Bill Yachty. He was my auditor and a very good friend. And he said, look, these critics, meaning ex-Scientologists and some critics were people that were never in, but they were fighting Scientology, are really hurting our church. And you need to help us. And I said, okay. And what do you need me to do? Because he, he said, and this is always how cults are. You know, it's like, Ron, I think you're the only person that can do this, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, it kind of plays into your ego. And it's like, okay, I'm the only one that can do it. All right, what, what is it? And yeah. he said, they don't take walk-ins to, to order an email. You have to do it on the internet. But I want you to walk in bring a uh, cashier's check so they can't trace us, which you would think right there, I should have just walked out. But I was so in it by then, and they knew it. I'd said in my sessions with Bill Yachty, I trust you with my life. If yeah. you told me to do anything, I would do it. So they knew, hey, she's going to be perfect. Yeah. So go in with the cashier's check and uh, open up an email account, get the email and a password and get it to me. And I did. I did it. And I swear to God, he had a grin, like think of a corner to the corner of the room. I mean, he, he was just so happy. And I said, what? And he said, you have just changed the history of the Internet. And I said, Bill, how can I change the history of the Internet when I don't even know what it is? <laughs> but That's wonderful. Yeah, I, yeah, I that appreciate that because listen. I'm, I tell people I'm, I'm digitally challenged. You know, I'm, I grew up in an analog era and right. a, a kid in third grade could beat me out on the internet. I got to tell oh. you. Anyway, anyway, we spoke about this earlier, so go on. So anyway, they got me to continue opening up these accounts. They, I said, what are you going to do with them? And he said, I'm not going to tell you because they're really evil. 
they'll get you in deposition, which is really what the Church of Scientology does, but I didn't know that then. And they said, and he said, um, they'll get you in deposition, but if you don't know what we're doing, you can just honestly say, I don't know. And you know me, Tori, I wouldn't do anything illegal. And I did trust him. So I thought, okay, you know, all right, I'll do it. So I started opening up these phony accounts, getting him the email, getting him the password, not knowing what he was doing. They were acting more and more mafia-like. I grew up in Chicago around the mafia. And I started thinking this guy, Gavino Ida, who worked in OSA, because I was just a volunteer. I was just helping. But Gavino was on staff in the Sea Org. And I thought, I think Gavino might be the mafia. You know, and I... And I apologize for saying anything against your son, but you know, you left too. So, you know, he had the dark side to him. Oh, and yeah. I thought it's not beyond Miscavige, Dave, uh, David Miscavige to hire a mafia guy. It's 10,000 bucks. You can get somebody and they'll kill these guys. And yeah. I thought, you know, it's not, it's not, it wasn't out of my realm of thinking that they could, whether David or somebody that worked for them, but it was kind of a little crowd of mafia-like guys. And I thought it's really not beyond them to shoot someone and kill them. And wow. so then, so that was really, I thought, you know what? No, I, I got to go look and see what, what they're doing on the internet. And the reason I wasn't looking is because my friend, my dear friend to this day, Nancy Maney, I didn't know they had drugged and reverse audited her. Auditing makes you better. Reverse auditing makes you worse. And that's what they had done to her because she was a plant for David Mayo and she was waking up and they didn't wow. want her. They yeah. didn't want to know about that. Wait Do you have a question on that? Yeah. David, David Mayer was using Nancy as a plant. David Mayo. He didn't know it. No, the church was sending Nancy in to find out about David Mayo had left the church. I got it. Yeah. Started his own group. They wanted to know what's Mayo doing, get us information. And okay. that's what they do. They basically, if <clears> you're really working, see, this is one of the misunderstoods for me is that a, a lot of people think I posted on the internet for the internet. And I didn't. I post, I did make 4,000 posts in four weeks when I was waking up, but I had already had this big, and I'll tell you about it, but I had this big break with osa i didn't want to have anything to do with them so it was just me tori on the internet but before then nancy had melted down was jumping out of the back you know she's written a book about it she's done interviews on it they did a whole documentary on her and um so i thought and bill of course said tori the only reason she's acting that way is because she's reading the internet so i oh, said boy. really so I was like, boy, I'm not going to read the internet. They really do scare you to death. So yeah. I wasn't going to, and I did trust him. But now, roll forward, I didn't trust him because he started saying, don't call me Bill on the phone, call me Jack. And I'm not going to call you Tori, I'm going to call you Katie. And I'm like, why? And he said, because they have your phones tapped. Well, the church, is, the church had my phone tapped. That's really what happened. Yeah, I know that. Now, wait, yeah. wait before we go on, because... You already jumped to the 90s between 1969 when you got in and the 90s. Did you do anything for the church in that period or were you just? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, I did a lot of things. I got trained, number one. So I was an auditor. I joined the Sea Org and was on the boulevard out in the, uh, you know, here in LA, in LA Harbor, doing the ship right. training. Right. But I have epilepsy. And so I ran out of my medicine and they said, no, no, no. They sent me to this 18 year old kid and he said, no, no, we're the top 10% of the planet. You can't be on medication and be in the sea org. So we're going to help you. We're going to get you off your medication and you're going to take vitamins and do Dianetics and get off of it. And I was a 22 year old kid, believed him completely, thought, okay, I'll do it. And yeah. I started having seizures and grand mal seizures and getting worse and worse. And I was losing my short-term memory. And my mother started following it. And she re she said, they're going to kill you, Tori. And I, no, no, Dianetics will fix it, mom. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's working. Okay, so the worse I got, the more she started calling me. And she called me one night and she said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, I'm going out on a date. She said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow. 
And she called me the next day and she said, how was your date? And I said, what date? And she said, okay, that's it. Wow. She said, either you are on your medication today and your doctor calls me today, which was Dr. Dank L. Ron Hubbard's doctor, right. and says you are on your medication or I, your mother, I'm going to fly from Chicago to L.A. By tomorrow morning, I will be there. And believe me, L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology will never forget your mother. And I knew my mom, she could kick ass. And my dad, they both had media lines all over the world because of the football thing. Now, I don't know about all over the world, but certainly all over America. Well, yeah, so, you're, you're a pro football player. You're, you're, you're known throughout yeah. all of America. Yeah. Not necessarily back then, but, you, but he was because he was a broadcaster. So yeah. he'd become yeah. very well known. So, so then I was like, okay, I don't want to have seizures anyway. I'm happy to take the medicine. The medicine yeah. totally controls the seizures. It was the last one I had. But mm -hmm. they started, that was a fight I had for 30 years. And that's really one of the major reasons I got out. But point being, I was in the Sea Org. Then they finally routed me out. Then I was on staff, which is just, you're not Sea Org, but you're staff as an auditor. Right. Okay. Then they got rid of that. NSO, remember that non-Sea Org staff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so they got rid of that. So then my husband and I moved to to uh, around Clearwater, that area. And at the time, I didn't know this, but and I had never done anything. I tried to do, join the guardian's office. Thank God they wouldn't let me, which they were doing really creepy things, but I didn't know it. See, that's the thing. Most people in the, the Truman Show of Scientology don't know all this stuff that goes on, that most of the people around the world go, how could they stay if they knew that? Yeah. But the thing is, you don't know it, right? Did you no, know it? No, you don't know it. I didn't know it. I mean, look, at I was on staff for 26 and a half years, and uh, where I was was at the, the base in Hemet, California, the Golden Air Productions base. And Which they, nobody in knows where that is. Of course, everybody knows it now. You know, only yeah. three quarters of the world knows it. Right. Uh, but we had a filter on the Internet where you could buy clothes or you could get little necessities. But anytime the word Scientology or Miscavige came up, you were blocked from knowing. Anyone. Right. And right. It literally, it was radio silence. I didn't know of any of this stuff. Right. Right. Exactly. So this was 79 before the Internet. And I'm in Clearwater. And there's like just miles of people honk out Scientology, stamp out Scientology, all this stuff. And Milt Wolf calls me into the office and says, Tori, we came here on a lie. His Richard Tinney is running from city commissioner to mayor and you need to handle it. And I'm like, me? I have a brand new son. I, you know, how am I going to handle it? And he said, just get out there and talk to the people. And that's all I ever did was go and talk to the people. But I did. I talked to him. I went to meetings. I talked to Richard Tenney. And I ended up getting, he, he got voted out of office, slam dunk. So I went from kind of nobody to like, call Tori. She can handle anything. You know, because they couldn't handle it. I mean, it was a pretty big thing to handle. Well, you're gutsy and you have a good communication cycle. I could see this totally. I mean, <laughs> I met you out in California when I come out to do the Joe Rogan show. And you're, you're a memorable person. And I, I mean, it sincerely, you, you know how to talk and you, you can handle people. Well, thank you. Well, I, I mean, they should have known that. You know what I mean? It's like I, I had done a lot of stuff for them because once I did that in 79, over and over and over, they would have. Me. That's how I kind of woke up because they would call me to go out and handle the critics that were picketing outside Celebrity Center. And I would go out there and try to talk to them. And they were all yelling and screaming all these facts about Hubbard. And, you know, you have what I call plexiglass, where it's just, it, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't go in. You don't even hear it. No, I right? know. It yeah. just bounces off. And so, but this one guy, not a Scientologist, just this critic fighting Scientology, but he kept asking me, he said, Tori, if you're free, why can't you read certain books? And I said, I can read any books I want. I just don't want to read those ones. They're filled with lies and stuff like that. Having never read one of them, right? Yeah. See, that's oh, yeah. the thing. Where Scientologists are always sure they know the facts, but they never read the facts. Nope. They're, so they're, it's kind of the ultimate in mind control. So anyway, long story short, he kept asking me. I went home I, in this bedroom. 
And up on my wall were these Dalmatians. And it was like 10 Dalmatians, all black and white. And one of them had a pink collar around it. And it said, dare to be different. And I laid in bed and I thought, I'm about as different as a rock. (laughs) (laughs) And that was the beginning, frankly, of me waking up. It was the beginning of me kind of looking differently at things. Wait a minute, this book, Dare to be Different, that's not about Scientology. It's just about it wasn't a, a book. It was just a little poster with these Dalmatians. Oh, really? And it just had a thing underneath it saying, Dare to be Different. But no, oh. I never read anything against Scientology ever while I was in. I what? did go, I had massive migraine headaches, and Scientology is like a triangle, and I had worked my way up to the second to the top, OT7, yeah. and it wasn't helping me at all. And so I started going to bookstores and Nancy and I had a little joke where we had our own secret mafia. I mean, our own secret library where we would go into the library, find a book that would help us. You know, they're like 19 bucks, 20 bucks. Yeah. And some of them are fabulous and they're better than Scientology. You know, know. self-improvement. So by the time I left, I read those for 10 years. I honestly think Because when I left, I met these academics who studied cults. And they said, we've never met anyone who's left who's as happy as you are. And I said, well, I I spent 10 years. I think the self-improvement books stripped off some of the mind control. Do you see what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was able to think by the time I left. Yeah. Uh, Listen, at the end of my book, uh, which is here, it's called Ruthless uh, Scientology, My Sunday and Me. In that you book, move, move it over a little bit because you can't quite see it. How's that? Is that a little better? Yeah. yeah, that's better. In that book, at the end of the book, I give authors who wrote in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that I was introduced in, the first time by a good friend of mine who's a, a fitness guru. His name is John Peterson. He told me to read a book called The Master Key System by Charles Handel. The, oh. that, that's in this, in, in this book at the end. And that led me into uh, Atkinson, uh, very uh, Waddles, uh, other authors of the time, who right. investigated life. They were philosophers, and right. they made discoveries about life that are legitimate. And you can hold their discoveries up to life and see if they're true. But what they didn't have was an agenda that L. Ron Hubbard had. So right. they weren't trying to suck you into some cult. They just wanted to help their fellow man. And like exactly. you're talking about these self improvement books. I, you're you're hundred percent right. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's just facts. It's just you can go out and try it or not. But if it helps you, it definitely helped me. It was amazing. Yeah, that's that's what I say. So that that covered the period up to the nineties. Then is that right? Yeah. So I got rid of Richard Titty. Then now I'm out handling the critics from the nineties to up to two thousand. You know, I'm I'm they're sending me out to handle these critics. And the critics are yelling all this stuff. Now I'm talking to that one guy. I start waking up. Yachty starts asking me to handle the crit, you know, to open up these phony accounts. Right. I start realizing they're mafia-like. Maybe Miscavige has hired the mafia. I better go look on the internet. And the day I looked on the internet, this is an interesting one. Back then, which people won't know about that are new, but back in 2000, the only thing on the internet was xenu.net, which is Andreas in Norway, who was never in, just a right. computer geek who saw a bunch of weird stuff about Scientology, put it together, made a website, and Alt Religion Scientology, ARS, which was a linear, you know, you just made a topic, another topic, another topic like that, right? Wow. And their goal was to drive the topics down the first page onto the second. Because their view was nobody really reads the second page of anything. So if someone said L. Ron Hubbard was a liar, they don't want that up there. They got to get that down the page and or under the other one. So their goal with me opening these phony accounts, what which I didn't know, was to basically, you know, manipulate the internet. So I the day I went on to look, they had baking recipes on there. The entire linear page was baking recipes. Wow. And in between it were these guys saying, I didn't say that. Scientology is changing my words. And I think, oh, my God, 
that's it. They're, they're using my accounts to stop free speech. And I'm a free speech advocate. I can't do that. And see, that's the thing. For everyone who's out, we all hit that wall of something that wasn't right for us. Yep. And we just can't do it anymore, right? That's exactly and, right. Yeah. Right. Right. So I call up Bill Yachty and I say, Bill, hi, I've got to go back to work. I just can't do this anymore. He goes, okay, no problem. Just meet us at this apartment in Glendale. I'm not thinking, I really have never seen the dark side of Scientology. I'm just thinking he's my best friend. He's my auditor. No problem. Yeah. And so I walk in, it's all men. They're all big men. The lights are very dim in the apartment. They all knew me like it was Jim Clergis and people like that, all that were working with Yachty. And usually before they'd give me a big hug. Hey, Tori, hi. And now they're all like, hello, 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 you know, but very cold. And I think, okay, something's going on here. And Yachty's not there, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, something's wrong. But I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the door slams open and in comes Gavino, tall, skinny Italian guy, the guy that I thought was part of the mafia. And he looks at Yachty, it's he and Bill. And he goes, I warned you about her. I warned you. And I look at Bill and I'm like, he warned you about what? And it was like a two hour, I call it a spiritual rape, where they were just yelling at me and asking me questions and all kinds of stuff. And I finally just burst out laughing, ran out. Bill knew he fucked up and he came running after me. And I said, get away from me. Get away from me. That's it. That's it. And I jumped in my car. I drove home. And my, you have to get my husband knew nothing of any of this. Nothing. Because wow. I had signed a $100,000 thing saying I won't tell David Miscavige, RTC, Heber Gents, any auditors, any ethics officers, any anybody. And I looked at Yachty and I said, this is like the Guardian's office shit, you know, from years ago where 11 people went to prison. Oh, yeah. And he said, he said, uh, Tori, look at me. Trust me. I wouldn't do those kind of things. This is just a formality. Just sign it. We have the best auditors in the world that'll help you. So that's that was the beginning of it. Now roll forward to I'm trying to get out of it. And they're just treating me like shit, right? Yeah. It's like, what happened to the best auditors in the world? Well, I'll tell you, this is uh, so reminiscent of everything I've seen them do. That Right. It's, they are like the mafia. They're, yeah. they're, they're a criminal organization. They and are. This falls under the subject of justified thought. Just let me interject this and we'll get back to you in a second, okay? What is it? Justified what? Justified thought. Okay. Explain Mm -hmm. that. Okay. I'll give you an example to explain it. Okay. I think the whole audience is familiar with the name Goebbels, who was the minister of propaganda under Hitler, right? Sure. Right. Goebbels' wife, when they knew the end of the war was coming and they lost it, literally murdered her children. She had five children. He got a doctor to prescribe, not to prescribe, to make up this potion where she gave the kids this before they went to bed so they would be unconscious, put a cyanide pill in their mouth and chomped their jaw jaw on it and to kill them. And her justification was this, that she didn't want her children growing up in a non-socialist state. In other words, there would not be the National Socialist Party and they'd have to grow up in maybe a democracy or a social. Oh, my God. Socialist. Oh, yeah. This actually happened. But look, look at this. If she had that justified as to why that was the most survival thing to do. Right. It made it OK for her to do it. Right. And with Scientologists, they justify their actions by saying it's for the greater good. Oh, that's that's what you mean by justified thought. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. And And they do have explain the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, because that's a big that's a big key to it all. Yeah. But the point is, the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics in Scientology is the Church of Scientology. That's that's the trump card. It doesn't matter if it's good for your family, (laughs) if it's good for your children, or if it's good for mankind, if it's not good for Scientology. Everything else is canceled. And do it. <laughs> That's so well put. 
I'm that's telling so you. well put. It's true. We both have experienced this. You know this to be true, and so do I. I do. I do. People, people listening to this, some of them would say, oh, it can't be that way. Well, I'm sorry. It is that way. It and is remember, that way. And the other thing is other people all the time say to me, I would never do that. And I say, okay, first of all, we did not have the internet. So the knowledge that you have, we did not have. So you can't even imagine what it's like to be in a cult where everyone's surrounding you. And we made the first video. It's called OT Panel. And some people can look it up. It's a really good video because it's four people who got all the way to the top, got realized it was a con, escaped out. And now we're in Greg Barnes's living room in Clearwater, all telling our stories. And they're all four different stories. It's amazing. It really is. What is the name of it again? Because I want the audience to get this so they can go and watch it. Because you've done a lot of wonderful videos. I mean, Christ, it's not like (laughs) you've done. How many have you done? A hundred? I've done 800 videos. Unbelievable. Well, not unbelievable yeah. because you're. But I mean, I started in 2000. When I started, nobody was speaking out. I yeah. would write to your son on the internet, TikTok, TikTok, time is on our side. What did I mean by that? We, every person, every Scientologist, every ex Scientologist, every critic, every now anonymous, the never ends, all these people, we can all say, yourself included, look at both sides, make up your own mind. Because we know if people will honestly look at both sides, they'll never walk in those doors. Right. But the Church of Scientology, including your son, has to keep making sure we are slime, including his own father. You know, they've got websites up against you, lies up about me. Every lies up about Leah, they have to keep pounding that stuff. And the truth is, and this was for years, it was me and about four or five other people speaking out with our names. A mm-hmm. lot of people were speaking out, but they wouldn't say their names. Yeah. But what the real cracking point was anonymous in 2008. And they took on the Church of Scientology. And they were the ones that totally changed the whole history of the Church of Scientology. Because they said, you know what? Not on our watch. Tom Cruise does not own the internet, and neither do you. We do, the people, and we're going to show you we do. We're going to we're going to shut down your website for three days, and we're going to show you who owns the internet, right? And I was against hacking back then. I'm out now, but I was like, I, I don't. I'm really not for hacking. And so I made a post. Oh, this is just the office of special affairs. They're just trying to distract off this guy who wrote a book about Tom Cruise, you know, the unabridged thing about Tom Cruise. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I thought. So anonymous calls me that night. This is anonymous. And they, they told me their plans. And at the time they weren't exactly the safest plans. Let's just say that. And I said, look, these guys are really totalitarian. They will put you in prison. We've got to do something totally legal, totally safe, totally okay. And they said, what? And I said, let's do a picket. So we did. We did a picket, 500 people here in LA, 9,000 around the world in every major city. And that day of that picket, Mark Headley, I had known him on Xenu.net chat board as Blown for Good. That's his nickname. But I didn't, we all knew he was from gold because he knew all these top secret things about Miscavige and stuff, David. Oh, yeah. and just gold and the operations of it. But we didn't know who he was. So that day at that pic that I'm holding my little sign and he walks up and he goes, I'm blown for good. My name's Mark Headley. And the same for Jenna Miscavige, who's the niece. She yep. came up and said, I'm Jenna Miscavige. You know, it was just so great. It was like all these people came out of the woodwork that day. It was amazing. That was fabulous. And I, of course, Jenna is my granddaughter. I mean, she yeah, wonderful. yeah. Yeah. She's a wonderful kid. She's I'm sorry. Great. I call her she's a kid. A really... She's in her 30s now, but she's just, uh, and her kids, uh, just beautiful little kids, Winnie and Archie. <laughs> I love those names, Winnie and Archie. That's so great. I know. It was Winifred and Archibald, but Winnie and Archie. And, I know. I love uh, that. I told this story priorly, but I think it's worth telling again. We visited them last year, and while we were there, and I would play games with them and just enjoy their company. I mean, it's just great to be around. And sure. uh, 
I said, now look at Winnie. I'm your great grandfather. You already have two grandpas, you know, your grandpa Ronnie and grandpa from his father, you know, when, when he's father's side. Right. So I, you, you can call me grandpa, but why don't you call me Jadek? That's a little different. What is it? It's Jadek. That's Polish for grandfather. But since oh. I'm great grandfather, that would distinctly make me different than a regular grandpa. Oh. So I, could you call me Jadek? And she looked at me and I says, okay, so what should you call me? She looked at me and said, bubbles. I said, <laughs> <laughs> Quinny, I want you to call me Jadek. So what should you call me? She said, bubbles. bubbles. I said, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Just a, a great little kid, you know. Oh, bless her heart. And I'm so happy you have them in your life. That's so yeah. great. Anyway, um, that's an aside. But, and you, you got involved in Anonymous. Now, how about this fair game? Did they ever put you on a fair game thing? Yeah, they did. They actually started again because i left in 2000 so not uh, it, really people didn't start speaking out and writing all these books and everything till after anonymous in 2008 so that's eight years of me and a few other people just like you're saying we got interviewed all the time janet reitman interviewed me for two three hours and said i'm gonna do a totally hardcore story you know article on this story about you and the kids the second generation kids then the article, they flew in the editor to Celebrity Center for a week. And the article came out. It was per, pretty much a puff piece for Scientology. Had one line in it about me. It said, Tori Crispin, she's a wacko, Mike Rinder. So now roll forward. Marty's out, Marty Rathbun. And he and Mike are buddies at the time. This is before Marty got weird. Yeah. And he had his blog. And I was only posting the history of the critics because everybody was sort of like, hail Marty, you're the greatest. And I'd say, look, there's a lot of people that have fought for a long time before Marty. You know, oh, yeah. and I'd list out, you know, for, starting with Paul Ed Cooper, Jerry Armstrong, Jesse Prince, you know, all those guys who left in the night in the dark with nobody. You know, Jesse was out for five years, he told me, before he found Stacy and Bob. So, and, you know, some other people that were out. Yeah. And uh, it was a tough time, you know. So anyway, long story short, now I forgot what I was saying. What was I telling you? That's my short term memory. You're talking about Marty and him going south, you know, turning around and. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. OK, so Marty. So I'm posting the time track of the critics on Marty's blog. That's all. Nobody wanted to talk to me because most of them are independents, meaning they're out of the church, but they're still using the tech. And yeah. I was very clear I was not in that group. But I wanted them to know the time track of the critics. So I kept posting it day after day after day. So finally, a thing comes up on on uh, Black PR, which is, you know, lies spread. Out. It's, it's basically what they're doing to you and me. They're Black PRing us, trying yeah. to get people to think less of us by writing lies about us. Character so assassination, he, that's what I call it. Character assassination. So he writes a whole article on that. And I post, oh, Marty, speaking of that, I've never even met Mike Rinder, but he said I was a wacko on that article with Janet Reitman. So was that black PR, third party, or a program? Which was it? No answer. Hmm. And he, always he'd say, you know, we're re reviewing your comment to see if we're going to post it. I never thought he'd even post all the critical, you know, history, but he did every time. So I was impressed with that. So now I ask it again. No answer. The next day. That was one thing I learned in Scientology was TR3. Ask a question over and over until you get an answer. Yeah. So now it's the, third, <laughs> so it's the third day. I ask again and I say, you know, well, Marty, you know, what happened with this? Which was it? And he sends me this private email saying, open up a Hushmail account, which I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. It's like a secret account you can open up where he has to have the password. You have to have the password. Then you can open it up. And I thought it was like going to the principal. I thought he was going to bawl me out and say, just stop posting on my site. You're not an independent. Leave us alone. Go away. That's what I thought was going to happen. Right. So I opened it up, and it's a huge, for your eyes only, 25-step program.
to muzzle Tory. It was written in 2006. Wow. I mean, the hiring private investigators to join, to start get become part of my business, to lie about me, to get my husband to go to the better business, my ex-husband to go to the better business and complain about me. You know, just this, that, everything, you know, just step by step, which as wow. you can hear, it was an epic fail to quote anonymous. <laughs> so that was Marty and he, he turned the other way now, didn't he? I guess. Yeah. It's really too bad, but that's, it is too bad. Cause, uh, I know when I was writing my book, he encouraged me to write it and thought it was great. And then after he turned around and he's doing videos for the church, He's now saying my book is a piece of crap, you know, and it's no good, and I'm lying. It's so weird. It's so weird. I mean, it, it's it's even hard for us who we know they do that, yeah. but it, to know someone would be that manipulated. But we don't know. Like I know this. Like when it happened to Bob Minton, Bob Minton started LMT, which was the Lisa McPherson Trust. They had killed Lisa McPherson, and he started a trust to expose that. And then ended up on the church side. <clears throat> and a lot of the critics turned on him. I would not because he saved my life. And I said, no, you know, this guy saved my life. I'm not going to turn on him. Yeah, but yeah. it's tricky. You know, it's tricky because, you know, like I said to everybody back then, if somebody squeezes your balls tight enough, you're going to say uncle. You know, yeah. and we don't know what they had against Bob Benton. We don't know what they had against Marty. But yeah. I know that I know some things I can think of that might have done it. Yeah. Would you care to share or you want to keep them under your vest? No, I'm sure. Marty has always said he has the last three days. Be well, see, everything about Lisa McPherson is on the Internet. All the worksheets, everything, except the last three days. I guess it was in on the last three days. Marty and David Miscavige. And I'm pretty sure David Miscavige said to Marty, you either get the hell out of here and start turning on Tony, Karen De La Care, and whoever else he lists out, or we're coming after you. We're going to put you in prison because murder is, there is no statute of limitations on murder. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure he and probably David, and I'm not saying they were, I'm just saying I'm guessing they were part of some form of her getting killed. You know, I mean, I think they murdered her. I do. I mean, gee, look at what happened. Look at the worksheets, even the stuff we can see where she's got the bug bites all over and stuff like that. I mean, she was a mess. Yeah. Boy, she sure so, was. I, I mean, I can't say they did, but I can say they might have been part of it or they didn't stop it. Do you see what I mean? I but got I it. Think it was one way or the other, just like how David took over the church. How did he take over the church? He basically said, this is what Jesse Prince told me. He told, because L. Ron Hubbard was going to give it to Pat and Annie Broker. Have you ever heard that story? No, I haven't. Oh, really? Well, yeah. look, maybe I have, but what you're saying about uh, what he was going to give it to Pat, Pat and Annie, I, I heard that, but tell me what Jesse told you. I, I, didn't, I don't know that. Okay, Hubbard got really pissed off because the missions were making a lot of money back then. Now they don't even have missions. But back then they had tons of missions and they were their own businesses and they were making a lot of money. And Hubbard got pissed off and he said, look, they're my churches. I started them. I get a million bucks a week. Bring it over. And he was living on the ranch north of L.A. Right. And so every i think it was once a week or once a month i'm not sure which on that but some more than one person has confirmed it's right david and a few other people drove to vegas they'd party in vegas then they'd go over into nevada and then over into california to the ranch i mean they'd go to nevada to vegas then they'd go over into california to the ranch and give them the million bucks and he'd open up the suitcase throw it next to his bed that was it and this happened week after week after week after week. I, I think it was uh, Hannah Eltringham, who used to run the ship, who told me, she said, Tori, I think it was her. One of the women told me there was so much cash in that house where Hubbard lived. It was just ridiculous. They had to start op putting, they opened a barn to keep the money in. So now roll forward, Hubbard dies or they killed him. I don't know which. 
But whatever way, he died. To me, it's a little fishy. I knew Dr. Dank, and I don't think Dr. Dank was just off gambling while he died. I think they had it planned out. I do. But that's mm-hmm. my own opinion of it. Right. But it, anyway, um, Jesse said, David basically said to Pat, and Annie, or to Pat, get the hell out of here, or I'm going to put you in prison for the rest of your life for transporting money across state lines and never reporting it. And that's how he that night, you know, took over that event. You know, wow. I was at the event. You were at the event, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was at it. Wow. As a matter of fact, I tell you, I was um, Arthur Hubbard's personal handler, and I took him to the event to see it. <laughs> and what did wild? he say? Not too much. He was on the RPF at the time. And I <laughs> him up, and they trusted me. And. He was not going to escape from me. And uh, it wouldn't be that I would stop him. He just wouldn't do it. And uh, I drove him back, and uh, that was it. He didn't say much about it at all. Isn't that wild? But what did you think? What did you think about it? About Hubbard dying? and No, about David taking over. I thought it was a coup. I thought it was a definite exactly. coup. He, he just got right. people out of the way who wouldn't back him up and put his own people in that he could trust. and took it over right. and he, he was not appointed to be the successor no. that no. I surmise to be the truth. I never saw it in writing that he was going to be the successor. I never heard it from anybody. No. And, um, you know, of course, David would say that he was L. Ron Hubbard's best friend, which he would say this to me in confidence, which I, I didn't mind him saying that, you know, look at the time I was a Kool-Aid drinker. I was a card carrying, uh, Sign and he code. probably he probably thought he was. I mean, yep. I, I think he probably to this day thinks he is. You know, that's the thing I don't think people get is that people in Scientology in general are good people. They're yep. just brainwashed and they, yep. they honestly and they are fed by each other. You know what I mean? That it, it's a peer pressure of everyone. I mean, I can't even imagine how it's got to be kind of awful for him because. To me, I see it as, you know, the walls are tumbling down. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you, oh, yeah. yes, he's buying these bigger buildings. Okay, they're buildings. But yeah. as far as technically, you can go look at them. There's nobody in these big buildings. Yeah. Div 6 is dead. I go up there all the time. I stand out in front of Div 6 and I say, there's nothing free in Scientology. Yeah. And I say, believe me, I was in it 30 years. They took all my money. They won't give it back. My husband won't talk to me. My friends won't talk to me. Don't get in it. And they all, they were going to go into the movie. They just walk on. You yeah. know, I, I could stand out there all day and just keep cut there. But it doesn't matter. Their their real money is from these donators. And God knows why they're doing it. I mean, I don't, I can't even think with that. Can you? Yes, I can. And I'll tell you why. I think once you get to be that wealthy you have a different mindset and you feel that you're an important player in the game and yeah. that you owe a duty to keep Scientology afloat. And sure. I think that's how they think, look, I could be wrong. I reserve the right. No, to no, no, no. You're not wrong. Cause that's how I was too. That That's why I stayed. Remember when the finance police came, oh, you yeah. were in then. Yeah. And, and a ton of Scientology, like half of Scientology left yeah. and I stayed. And I stayed because this was my thinking. And I think most of the people in are still thinking this way. Someone has to stay to stand up for Ron. Yep. That's why I stayed. Foolishly, but true. I mean, yeah. it's a foolish th- a mindset. But that was my mindset, too. And I, yeah. I felt. I had to keep it going. I had to keep make sure the tech was applied and this was going to handle And you everything. can't see the bad stuff. Like you asked about fair game. When I was in, even though I helped get Richard Tenney out of office, I did not see that as fair game because yeah. I was just out talking to people yeah. and handling the critics. I was just talking to people. So to me, it wasn't fair game. Someone else could see it as fair game. Yeah. Now this thing about the internet opening up those phony accounts that was pretty much fair game, I would say, you know, because fair game for anybody who doesn't know, Hubbard said you can lie, yeah. cheat, steal, destroy someone utterly. Yeah. And I didn't see it as fair game because I trusted Yachty and I didn't know what it was. And once I did see what it was, I said, I'm out. 
you know, count me out. And then they attacked me and I left probably within six months after that. I got on the internet, made my 4,000 posts, which were not for the Office of Special Affairs. That's the biggest misunderstanding that people have. And I think it's just that they want to know somebody who did it. And I'm not it. I'm not. I opened the accounts. I didn't post for it. Yachty did and some other people, but not me. The 4,000 posts I made was what happened, just so you know this, and then I'll shut up. But no, I won't. But anyway. <laughs> Don't ever shut up. Don't learn that lesson. Give your mouth yeah, shut. I, I, I will. I will. But um, anyway, it, it, it's just I started thinking there's tons of fair game they've done to me after I left. You know, that was like, but I was telling you something else. And then I got on to thinking, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of fair game. That's why I said, no, I'm not going to shut up. But what was I saying right before that? Well, that you, the 4,000 posts. Okay, right. So I made the 4,000 posts thinking, because right before that, do you remember Battlefield Earth coming out? Of course I do. Okay. And it was a nightmare, right? Even for we who were in, we saw it as an awful film. Did you? Absolutely. Yeah, it was just a mess. But after it started this message board, the Battlefield Earth message board, and Yachty told me, he said, go on it and see if you can get, because see, Mark Bunker was Xenu TV. And so he said, Xenu is, at least then, it was a huge secret word that had never been in the transcripts, never been in the newspaper. You know, it was just, I mean, I think it was in one, like the Time Magazine article or something, but not much. People didn't know it. And he didn't want it on the Internet. And I and I was OT7. I knew it was against, you know, it's confidential. You can't let it out. So I kept trying to get rid of it, get rid of it. It wasn't working. So I finally got mad. I called Warner Brothers. I said, look, this is ridiculous. I live in Burbank. These people are on, you know, you've got a message board for Battlefield Earth. That's a movie, right? And he said, yes. And I said, but these people from the Church of Scientology are all over it, writing all kinds of stuff, sliming it out. It's stupid. You know, get rid of it. And so he said, okay, I'll I'll pass on the message. And I knew I'd already gotten high enough because I'm in sales, so I know how to get to the top dog. So I got to this guy. The next day, a guy from New New York calls me. He goes, this is Mr. So-and-so from Time Warner, and we got your message. We're taking down the message board, right, Mm. For, for Battlefield Earth. So, A, that's great. Good. I got rid of that, right? But you know what happened? I missed the critics. I really did. Because to me, by this time, the critics were like the old cowboys. They could say what they wanted. They could do what they wanted. Nobody controlled them, right? Yeah. And that's how it is when you leave the church. Once you leave the church, all of us got in hoping to become more free. And the truth is you become less and less and less free until you finally leave and then you get your freedom. Yep. I mean, it's so ironic, the whole thing. (laughs) It's wild. And I'm going to tell you with that, since we're running a little bit of time constraint, uh, I'm going to have to end this episode. I hope you're satisfied that you got your story told, Tori. I did. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for doing all these interviews. I just think it's great. You're doing it. Well, I'll tell you, I feel it's my duty. Uh, I'm a musician, as most everybody knows by now, and I do that for pleasure. But <clears throat> this is something I feel I have a duty to do. And uh, getting back to that, again, I'd like to bring up Patreon. Any of you out there who would like to contribute to the ongoingness of this program can go to my website, therealronmiscavige.com, and contribute whatever you'd like. It could be a dollar or two or five or whatever. It's all appreciated. And uh, the reason being, I want to keep it free, just as I had Tori on today, that she could say what she wanted, and she did. And I don't throw people under the bus, and I treat them with respect, and I'm going to keep this going. No matter what happens, it'll be a platform that you can come on and tell your story. So, again, if you would like to become a Patreon, yeah, if you'd like to become a Patreon, and I'll tell you, I think you'll feel a little better if you do it, because that means you're doing something about this. You don't have to, of course, obviously, but if you do, it's much appreciated and it helps. So thank you again, Tori. You're welcome. And one last thing I want to say is please, for everyone, keep reading, looking, and listening because all the, there's tons of information on the internet and learn both sides and make up your own mind. Good point, Tori. So again, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. 
I'll Thank see you, you in the next episode.